Okay, so we're going to start uh, the core concepts of uh, object-oriented programming, uh, if you remember. There are a couple of uh, miscellaneous topics which will be covered as part of the programming going forward, so I just don't want to waste time on the small topics. And uh, Okay, so today, today uh, the most uh, important or most chatted word, object-oriented programming, uh, all the concepts that we're going to talk. Um, so, if you look at the resources available around the uh, internet on this topic, uh, you will find uh, so many topics, so many articles, so many, so much of information available outside. Um, but um, unfortunately, each of that, each of those informations are addressing to a different level of understanding of what is object-oriented programming. And most of the times, uh, for beginners, it's going to be more uh, difficult to understand. Uh, believe me, it is one of the most simplest uh, topic. Uh, if it is not told correctly, it will be more complicated. Uh, and uh, if you think it is more complicated, then uh, uh, then try to think again. It's not that complicated. So I'll try to put it in a very simple uh, real-time uh, implementation perspective. So uh, that's the reason I started with this slide. Uh, so to understand the real uh, world of the object-oriented programming, uh, we just have to look around uh, in our day-to-day -day life and see what all you see. So to, before we look into that uh, uh, kind of an aspect, uh, what we need to see is how the programming was pre prior to this. It was pretty much a structure-oriented programming, uh, and most of you have never worked in a legacy coding, so you will never uh, even un know that how the structured programming works. It's pretty much like a function-based programming. If you look at the Clipper or Fox Pro uh, programs uh, with the legacy code, uh, they pretty much uh, coded based on the functionality, it's straightforward to the functionality. If you say, for example, uh, I do a billing system, so in a billing what happens, you take, uh, you scan an item, an item is fitted, the item uh, code is uh, keyed in, and you look it up into the rate and get the rate and done. So it's all function-based, so, um, and the major hurdle with the function-based or uh, um, structured-oriented programming uh, uh, is that the re reusability of aspects is more complicated. Uh, most of the cases, uh, it, uh, because you write uh, functions for everything and you achieve the uh, requirements spec and you're done, your application works good. But now once you get into the changes or scalability or, or extendability of the application, it's almost equal to zero because you cannot extend the functionality beyond a certain point. So all you can do is you can have to edit the respective functions every time uh, and you cannot extend those functionalities to a, a larger uh, system down the line. So um, so eventually uh, it's pretty much uh, back dated in uh, 1950s around uh, the, the thought process of object-oriented programming evolved and it evolved uh, based on the key concept of object. If you see the object, we have seen uh, what is an object, what is a class so far. So the concept of object itself is a base for the object-oriented programming. Okay, so the we'll see um, uh, how, how, how it is different from the structured-oriented programming. Okay. Um, so if you see the real world around you, so you'll see a lot of objects around you. As a table, I try to figure out how to show you. And I found a nice picture um, on the internet uh, that uh, shows a wide variety of objects around us. So whenever you write a program uh, with respect to, to a uh, business context, right, so we uh, the thought process, in other words, the, there's another topic called object-oriented thought process. Uh, there are a couple of books available on, um, uh, on this topic, especially uh, object-oriented thought process. So what the thought process ideally goes behind is that uh, whenever you write a program, you, pr you think the program um, uh, as a ma real-time mapping to the real-world objects. Um, so in simple terms, so if you see if you see a rabbit or an airplane or a desk or furniture, uh, egg, uh, earphone, so on. So you see a lot of different objects in a real-time life. And similarly, 
the thought process of a programming design, designing a program goes around uh, defining these objects so that uh, if you write a program that uh, matches the real-time business objects, then it makes it easy for you to extend it or scale it around. Okay, so that's the base uh, behind the object-oriented thought process. So quickly jumping into the what are those uh, uh, elements that really make a language as a object-oriented programming. So there are a wide variety of languages available. As I mentioned, a couple of them are uh, C, C++, Java, uh, VB.NET, C Sharp, VB6.0, uh, Python, uh, so on. Uh, there are a wide variety of languages. So in order to qualify a language to be called as an object-oriented programming language, so it needs to actually satisfy these uh, seven set of uh, um, concepts. Um, in other words, uh, the highlighted four, last four, if you see, look at the material outside, you will see they, whenever you, they talk about object-oriented programming, they always refer to the, only the last four. Um, so in, a, in general, uh, in theory, if a language is supposed to be categorized as an object-oriented programming language, then it need to satisfy all these seven uh, set of uh, concepts. So we have already seen what is a class and object in the previous sessions and uh, we'll see uh, them again uh, today. So the seven uh, aspects are the class, the object, the message passing, in other words simply message. Um, the fourth one is encapsulation, fifth is abstraction, sixth is polymorphism and seventh is inheritance. So these are the seven um, um, cat, uh, characteristics that a language should possess to be qualified as an object-oriented programming language. Okay, So we'll see one of uh, each of them uh, <clears throat> in detail. So the first one is a class. We have already seen the class and uh, we will see a different dimension to a class today. So when we declare a class, um, in simple words, it defines the state and the behavior of a class. So the state and behavior, um, so, um, so if you see the class has two uh, aspects, uh, main two aspects are the state and behavior. So this is, these are the two characteristics that any uh, living object or any object if you see around uh, will possess. The state is normally defined, uh, uh, represents the properties. If you see a real time uh, object like this, um, so um, uh, the class as a, as a different dimension to a class. Uh, it provides the definition of the state and behavior of an object. So, um, so the behavior in a, in other term is an action word, um, which means uh, it's a verb in uh, which has some action to it. So, uh, so every objects do something. Some objects do nothing, but they have their representations. Uh, or like a flower vase, if you see, it might not have any action items but uh, it resembles uh, something, some meaning to the, uh, to the real world. Um, so it, it, it is used for decoration, in other words. So usage-wise is another word. So another, another dimension to that is a usage, okay? Uh, the properties, if you look at um, that a object possess, uh, in this example is a pretty uh, familiar example, is the car. If you take a car as an example, uh, on the left hand side if you see the state uh, the state of a car how you define a, the color of the car the number of doors or number of wheels or has headlights um, um, and the number of windows and so on so these are all uh, attributes or parameters or, or in simple uh, coding coding wise as properties of an object represents the state and the behavior, as I mentioned, um, is the action items uh, that a, uh, the, uh, the object can possess. So uh, what car can do, a car can honk, it can start, stop, drive, or open trunk, and so on. So there are a number of uh, action items that a car can do. So in, if you compare the class definition, so it pretty much has the state and behavior uh, information with it. So why it is a blueprint? If you look at a normal blueprint, um, uh, so 
in in a single word if someone asks you what is a class so the single line answer would be uh, a class is a blueprint of an object okay so as a single statement you don't have to worry about it and uh, if you know what is a blueprint and most uh, most of your engineering graduates know what is a blueprint and this is uh, a blueprint of a car so it pretty much show you the complete uh, spe spec of the uh, the object that need to be produced out Okay, so even if it is for look at an architectural diagram of or uh, the a blueprint of the uh, of a building or so on. So this is a bedroom, this is a dining room, and so on. So it has uh, specific dimensions and specific attributes attached to each of the components that need to be developed. So needless to uh, uh, prolong on this, uh, this is um, a pretty much straightforward. So in general, class will have the definition remember this it has a definition of a state and behavior of an object so many times we will get confused with the class and object so that's the reason I'm stressing out here more so in the coding perspective if you go um, map your um, blueprint in terms of a code right so if you see the code here uh, class car all these the state definition is pretty much using a properties here so, um, so this is a short form of writing a properties wherein uh, I avoided having a local variable and exposing them using a property. So to make this uh, look simple, uh, but this is a valid statement though. Uh, you can still uh, write properties uh, without having local variables defined uh, when you don't want to enforce getters and setters. Um, so this is the feature available from .NET uh, language, uh, I believe uh, 2.0. Uh, wherein you can have a short form of uh, uh, properties and uh, behavior is defined in terms of methods here uh, so all these methods like start drive honk these methods will define the behavioral aspects of the class car so in code if you see this is a raw code here I'm going to write what this start going to do what this drive going to do what this honk going to do so this is pretty much the blueprint so I'm going to define what this uh, action going to perform and what this property going to hold. What uh, so I'm defining these in terms of a code uh, uh, by writing class. So the class is a definition of your object. Okay, so properties will define the state and the methods will define the behavior. So it's pretty much clear. And the on the right hand side, if you see, this is a class diagram. Um, so UML, if you have ever uh, heard of it, or definitely you might have heard of UML modeling, uh, unified uh, modeling language. Uh, using UML, you normally uh, uh, define the class diagrams, and this is a class diagram um, uh, that Visual Studio, uh, the architectural edition, uh, provides. Uh, if you have the Visual Studio with the architecture edi edition, then you will uh, also be able to see uh, the, uh, the class view of your code. So the left hand side is the class and the right hand side is the class view, uh, or the class diagram in other words. Okay, so pretty much the UML class diagram uh, looks the same. Uh, it will have the on, the, on the top, it will have the name of the class and its type. Uh, it's a car, is a class uh, of type, uh, a stereotype is a class and it has fields and here I'm adding the fields uh, uh, right now we don't worry about that we worry about the properties and methods and uh, the list of properties and methods are available within the class so this is a typical class diagram okay so now what is an object <clears throat> So we have a blueprint. Now the, each of the uh, blueprints specified the details of uh, how this should be, how the door should be, uh, what the honk do, what the drive do, what the stop do, and so on. We have defined it uh, in the blueprint, which is our class. So once you create an instance of that, um, it becomes an object. So if you see the class and object are interrelated to each other, uh, so th that's the confusion people do normally have uh, whenever people ask what is a class and what is an object. So if someone asks what is a class, a class is a blueprint of an object. And what is an object? An object is an instance of a class. That's straightforward. Both are definitely interrelated. Okay, so you create, you define the class visualizing some concept. 
So car is a uh, is a uh, realization of that concept, and we see car in our day-to-day -day life. If you think about a flying car, which is again uh, becoming a real uh, in the today's market again, uh, probably not in the market, but uh, technically people have been working out to have a flying car. So flying car is a concept that is visualized and you, you don't see it normally in the road today. Uh, so if you start defining the uh, the state and behavior of a, a flying car and uh, that becomes your blueprint and once the blueprint is transformed into a real-time object it becomes a object and which you can see feel and do things on top of it so so object is a realization of a class in other words you can say it. so the class is a blueprint so okay keep in mind um, so in, in a simple context here uh, we have a blueprint of a car which is sent to the manufacturing unit and the manufacturer has manufactured multiple instances of that blueprint. So that's the difference between a, a class. A class is going to have only one copy in the memory. So once the compiler loads the class into the memory, you can actually create any number of instances of that type. Okay, you can have a, here if you see the car, red, blue, green, so on. And each of the instance has its own state. State in sense, each of the uh, object here, if you see, uh, this car has its own state, saying it has uh, its own color. Uh, it might have its own wheels in terms of alloy wheels or normal wheels or so on. So you have types of wheels and types of horn again. Um, honking is again not the same. You can have customize it, your own horn, what kind of sound you want to produce out, so on. So, so the state can be different for each of these instances. But they're all instances of the same class. So the state and behavior can be modified uh, using your messages. So we'll see that uh, in the next sessions, uh, next um, slides. So the object, in other words, uh, we are um, creating an object. Uh, we have seen the definition of an object and uh, we are creating an instance of that um, class. Here car is a, a class and C1 is an instance of that class. So I'm setting its state here and I'm invoking its behavior. And this is a real-time picture of a car. So when I, when I run my program, I will see this out because I, that's how I coded it and it's, that's what it is doing. Uh, at this stage, uh, the car implementation has nothing but uh, showing the parameters outside, uh, displaying its uh, state, in other words. And the state can be modified by calling its methods. Okay. So by calling its messages, so messaging is the integral part of it. And message, messaging is a wide topic again, and with respect to the, um, so wide topic in, in sense, uh, the messages can be um, uh, between the processes, between the threads, or it can be out of process, out of machine, out of networks, and so on. So the message is a wide, wide concept to talk about. It's pretty much, uh, um, it's a message passing is uh, a communication channel through which uh, multiple objects talk to each other. Uh, in object-oriented programming, it is uh, pretty much the same, uh, wherein the objects uh, involved in talking to each other uh, 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 while running the program. So to make your program successfully, the objects will communicate to each other. Uh, in, if you again translate this to a real-time picture, uh, if you say, uh, um, a, an object, uh, a human, right? Uh, say a employee, an employee, uh, employee, uh, and relationship with the uh, with the department. Say for example, so uh, there is an association between the department and an employee because the employee belongs to a department. So um, so they both communicate to each other in one way or the other during your real time application. So that kind of messaging is. Uh, yeah, is provided using the concept called message message passing. Okay, um, so the message passing in in this example, it's a pretty same example wherein I'm passing the uh, values to the uh, to define the state, and also invoking the methods um, to uh, to alter the state. In other words, okay, and uh, so the real time uh, object in the real time is going to uh, reflect the state that has been modified by your code. 
Okay. Um, the next, so the core concept uh, called the encapsulation comes into play. So encapsulation uh, 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 means that the uh, internal representation of an object is generally hidden from uh, view outside of the object's definition. So it's uh, pretty much uh, hiding uh, the data structures or the state of a class interface. Uh, it means multiple things. Um, Number one, uh, you can actually, uh, it, me it also means that the internal implementation details has been hidden from the outside. Okay, so if you see the previous one, when I'm setting C1 is equal to, uh, C1 dot make is equal to Nissan, Nissan I really don't know what's, uh, what's happening internally uh, with make. Uh, make implementation or even I when I'm calling the dot start I even don't know what's the internal logic doing it which you do not worry about again so even in in uh, real time if you translate uh, if you're playing a uh, audio system all you care is that audio should be audible and nothing else so when you play when you hit the play button it should start playing when you hit pause button it should stop so what as an end user uh, you expect from that uh, functionality of uh, the behavior of that particular object is that you don't really worry about what's happening internally. You all worry about what you want from outside. So the internal implementation logic is hidden or encapsulated. Uh, so capsule, if you remember, it's capsuling means putting things inside and you don't worry about it. So relate the term to encapsulation. So when you encapsulate uh, the uh, implementation from outside, uh, the concept translate to the encapsulation. Uh, so one of the example we have here is uh, using a property. Um, I'm having a local variable here, which is a private member. By default, if you declare any uh, local variables, it, it defaults to a private. Uh, in this example, I didn't specify explicitly private, but uh, uh, implicitly it defaults to private. So the int unique ID, we have seen the previous examples that this is a local variable and this cannot be accessed from the uh, from the instance of this class. So this can be accessed only using the unique ID uh, as a property. And what's happening within the unique ID? Unique ID is actually uh, updating or returning the value that is saved to the local variable. So what this achieved, uh, this is a simple example. Uh, using properties, you can uh, implement the encapsulation. Uh, in in sense, this adds a um, layer of an interface for the end user using a public keyword. So we haven't gone through the more of the access modifiers so far. So we have seen only the private and public. Uh, so the public will get, uh, only using public uh, access modifiers. You can expose the members to the um, the one who is using your class. In this case, so all the members you can access are of public. Okay. So encapsulation is a pro, uh, is a um, method of uh, uh, hiding the your internal implementation. It can be achieved using the access modifiers um, and exposing the private uh, access modifiers can be applied even for the, your methods. So method implementation, nobody really care. All they need is they call it and get it. Okay. So so every aspect is actually transformed to a real world. Uh, that's the key uh, uh, note that we need to keep in mind when we all when we talk about the object oriented. So any keyword that you see down the line uh, with respect to the code right now uh, will be transformed to the real world objects. Okay. If it is not, then you're actually deviating away from the object oriented principles. Okay. The next one is uh, abstraction. I think before uh, we step in uh, to the next topic, let me take a quick demo. Uh, I think uh, we have already covered this uh, um, aspects before uh, so I don't want to go and uh, do a small demos but still for those who want to uh, uh, recap or revise their memory I would uh, I will still allow to do it okay so the so far we have uh, seen uh, the the class and objects I will just like to uh, put a small demo there I'll just run the code that I already have 
in, in this case, I just have a high-level class uh, stating an automobile. Um, and I'm creating an instance of that uh, as a car here. I'm trying to, this is the same example that we see in the slides. And um, so we see the uh, automobile is the class and car is the object. So that's the distinction there. Uh, in other words, we refer this as an instance member. Um, so car is an instance of an automobile. So if you see the hierarchical representation of your entire automobile industry, car is, car falls one of them. So I'm trying to demonstrate that here. And, uh, and of course, the car has a make, model, wheels, and so on. Um, and uh, encapsulation aspect uh, is a pretty much the method. So I just classified the whole automobile into a state and behavior wherein within the state I have a set of properties and a couple of other things, uh, the constructor and the property. So this is one of the property which uh, actually implements the encapsulation, wherein it hides the private member, which is the model here. This is a private member. It is hiding the private member uh, from being exposed outside and it's controlling the access to the private members using a public property. So here I have a control on uh, uh, what values I can set and how uh, I can return it out. So that's the advantage of having property. So this is a typical implementation of an encapsulation principle. Okay. So if I run this code, it's pretty much uh, um, calling three uh, methods of the automobile class and uh, the values that are assigned to it are Nissan Maxima and latitude longitude. So I just had a latitude and longitude to the, uh, as a state uh, because car is a mobile uh, object so it can move from one uh, location to another location. So track the state of the uh, object that's one of the uh, means uh, uh, I just added and it has number of uh, wheels of four. Okay, so uh, that's still the uh, concept of encapsulation. So we'll move ahead. Next comes the abstraction. So abstraction uh, uh, is a very, very confusing topic, though different authors uh, define it in different ways. Uh, so I see this is one of the best way to uh, explain it or visualize uh, what does an abstraction means. Okay, so in in general, if you look at the English definition, uh, uh, abstraction is a concept or idea not associated with a specific instance. Okay, so that's the key there. And if you understand the basic English meaning, then you will know what is an abstraction is. Okay, so what it means is, is a concept or an idea not to associate any with any specific instance. Okay, for example, um, if you look at the chart below, so this is a pretty, uh, pretty much the animal classification diagram um, or chart. So in this, I, uh, we have all the five uh, classifications of the animal kingdom. Wherein we have mammals, uh, reptiles, uh, fish, birds, and so on. So if you look at this chart, what have uh, the definition of the abstraction is uh, pretty much clear there. If you start defining a, a program that represents the animal kingdom, so how will you design your classes? So it's a pretty much a, uh, you follow a chart which classifies all the identified uh, objects and generalize them to form into a groups so that you always ensure that you will keep only the information within a given class to what it is needed and what can be um, generalization concept uh, in the UML terms means uh, you're actually grouping them grouping the related objects into one so that you can share the commonality so why we are sharing commonality? Why? Because we want to reuse the commonality. So remember um, the core principles behind all the programming uh, uh, patterns or paradigm is to reusability, extendability, scalability, everything. So everything falls uh, under the reusability. So as simple as I don't want to write the same code a number of times in my application. So it, it's all write once and use many times. 
So, uh, so that's the principle goes behind everything. Um, so reusability is a key concept and the abstraction gives you uh, that flexibility to uh, have the reusability driven at a multiple levels. Uh, but this is again a thought process again as I was talking about object oriented thought process uh, is, uh, is a thought process that will think about the real time objects classified into a chart like this. So if, you have, uh, if there, there was none or no biologist or zoologist to sit, uh, sitting around and try to classify all these animals, we would never had this chart. So we, they have classified based on some common characteristics each of these objects possess in the real world. Okay, so insects have their own characteristics and uh, amphibians have their own characteristics. But though all of these uh, characteristics are shared as a common, they are called animal character, animal classification. So they are belongs to animal and another another dimension to it is the all of them are living beings, uh, living things, so on. So that's the kind of abstraction when you say so uh, it's a concept or idea not to associate with any specific instance. So the abstraction for in this diagram, if you see, the animal is an abstract layer. Or in the next level of abstraction is insects for animal. And at the same time, animal at the high level and the low level is again the respective subsets, uh, which is insects or amphibians or mammals or reptiles or fish, birds and so on. So that's how the classification goes on. So what you're achieving with this, we're achieving the common characteristics as grouped as one. So when I have an abstract class, so if I if I say uh, in the real car example, um, I have defined the automobile as an abstract class. Okay, so we'll just see the next one. Yeah, this is a similar example uh, wherein uh, the animal classification is shown, wherein animals becomes the abstract layer at the top, and the respective uh, are classified down down the, down the line okay so in this this chart this is a typical real time uh, code example that i have <clears throat> wherein i'm just classified the automobile industry wherein we already see uh, the automobile class and uh, which is an abstract class okay i just changed it uh, to uh, to the more the first part so i will roll it back um, to an abstract class so in, uh, in the coding perspectives, uh, you can achieve abstraction using the uh, abstract class and also inheritance um, and also using your um, uh, access modifiers. Of course, implicitly everything uh, falls under the same root. Um, so if you see the arrows that are uh, pointing at out, uh, the arrow represents the generalization in UM, UML terms. In other words, in uh, object-oriented terms, it is an inheritance uh, link. So if you see the truck is inheriting automobile, car is inheriting automobile, SUVs, scooter and so on are inheriting from automo automobile directly because they all fall under the same umbrella. But here the flying car is actually inheriting a car because a flying car is a special class of car. Uh, so that's why it's rooted out from car. So although it looks and looks like a car, but this car normally runs on the road. The specialization of the flying car is that it can fly and also drive on the road. So that's kind of a classification we have here. Okay, and remember, uh, this diagram also uh, show you one uh, important message here. The thing is, um, we can see car. Okay, we can see car, and we can see tons of cars out there on the road, and flying car is also we can see right now in YouTube. Uh, trucks we can see in day-to-day -day life, SUVs I can, scooters I can. So these are all objects that I can see uh, outside. So I can cre create an instance of this to become an object. So the object represents the real-time world, real-time object. So the automobile, there's nothing called automobile, right? So there's nothing called automobile that I can see. So automobile is a concept, it's a classification. So that cannot be instantiated, right? So if you translate this diagram um, to the real-time objects, so there is nothing called an automobile, 
only that an automobile is just a high level classification of all these uh, objects that you see. So that's why so high level classification cannot exist in the real world. So the classification is just a thought process or an idea or a concept um, which can be only on books. So that's why abstract classes cannot be instantiated. So when I make this um, abstract, so that's what the error shows. Okay, so we cannot create um, an instance of the abstract class or interface. So interfaces are other way to uh, achieve the abstraction. So you cannot create an in, um, uh, instance of them. So if you translate that rule in your programming language into real-time um, implementation, you can uh, clearly say that you cannot create instance of an abstract class or interface. So you will never forget it. Okay, so that's the abstraction. And now comes the another important aspect of a polymorphism. If you have any doubts on abstraction, so I try to put it in the simplest way so that you it sits in your memory. Um, I am a little fortunate in my career that uh, um, uh, I learned um, object-oriented principles from one of a very good teacher, and um, and st I still remember those concepts today and try able to tell you. Um, so I have seen uh, folks who are completely scared of object-oriented programming and w what what is this Greek word and all other things, but uh, trust me, it really helps uh, uh, the way you present it, and I hope you are getting it clearly. Okay, so polymorphism, if you see, um, it, it's the, the word itself is derived from a Greek, Greek word, which means uh, I'm having multiple forms. Uh, so since it is a Greek word, it is, not, it is good, it's kind of an alien uh, a keyword, if you see polymorphism, it, it really doesn't re relate to an English uh, for us to uh, grasp it easily. So if you see polytechnic uh, is another way, so poly means many. Okay, polymorphism, in other words, uh, is called form. So why I'm stressing this way? Because you relate the, uh, the if you relate these keywords to the real-time meaning, then you will definitely, will never forget what does this mean. So you will never forget, uh, you're confused between abstraction, uh, polymorphism, oh, I think it's other way around, things like that. So I've seen people uh, get confused between these two words or interrelate these words. So if you expand this uh, clearly, then you will uh, remember it um, much better way. So polymorphism uh, is a uh, poly itself stands for multiple, and morphism is forms. So it means multiple forms. So when you say multiple forms, then will you will know what I will we're going to talk now. Okay. So in programming, we can implement the multiple definitions of the same <coughs> name or method or function with variable parameters. So uh, in, in, it has multiple different types of polymorphism, but all of them uh, core aspect is if you have a method or, or a function, so all you can do is you have the same name shared uh, with variable parameters to have a different definition to it. So in other words, uh, how you relate this to a real-time uh, real world? Uh, it's a typical example uh, I could think of uh, out of my head, if you see. Uh, um, it's more like an artificial intelligence, uh, but I, may have, I might be going too long. Uh, if you see um, uh, the way you uh, communicate to others, you, the way you react to things, right? Uh, you might say um, hello as a simple way, simple way, or you might say hello in a different way or a different context. So hello itself has a different meaning based on how you invoke it or how you say it out, right? So in real term, in real world, uh, so if the object is trying to communicate to other object, uh, uh, that communication might be the same communication, but based on the context, the meaning might change. 
so it, that you you will see that uh, in in the real world every every day to day life so in the, even in english uh, there are so many instances you will come across that the meaning of a certain word will change based on the context that you use the word um, so that's the real world transformation if you look at so the polymorphism similarly achieves the same thing so you have the same name uh, having different meaning based on a different context okay so the meaning is uh, uh, is your definition uh, how you write it let me get into the code so that you can uh, have a quick glimpse so I'll take this typical example of uh, the automobile in this I have a start uh, the start method uh, uh, in this case, uh, the context uh, is defined in terms of the number of parameters that I'm passing in. So here I have a same name with two different contexts, which is two different set of parameters passed in. And also they have their own body. So in this case, I'm doing just writing something. And in this case, I'm actually doing little more than just writing it down. I'm just incrementing some values based on the Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is what a polymorphism means. So sharing the same name uh, uh, and uh, defining its own context, uh, defining its own body based on the context. So the context here is defined based on the parameters that I'm passing in and it has a different uh, body to be called. Okay, so how many types of polymorphisms we have? Uh, so this is again a wide uh, uh, topic of uh, uh, variance definitions you'll see on, on the uh, on the internet or the or the the flow folks all, all around on the community. Uh, so generally at the high level, if you say people might start directly with the low level, like they can say what is how many types of polymorphism you have. You have uh, method overloading, method operator overloading, or oper uh, method overriding. Uh, that's all three things you have. But if you really classify them based on the uh, based on uh, how they are or which context they are being used, then you can classify the high level as an ad hoc polymorphism and the parameterized polymorphism. So parameterized polymorphism is uh, um, probably I might uh, show you uh, down the line when we talk about generics. Uh, so you can achieve that using generics wherein uh, you create an object um, and uh, you, uh, the way you initialize the object will change the behavior of it. So there again you will use the same uh, name for a different use but at a class level. Okay, so the level at which you use uh, the, as a parameter as polymorphism is will change. Uh, so here it is completely at a very high level wherein uh, you can define a class with respect to constructor of a, a generic type uh, based on the type that you pass in when you create the uh, instance of that class, uh, its behavior will be different. So uh, that is a uh, concept of uh, generics. Uh, when we talk about generics, uh, probably I will uh, demo the parameterized polymorphism. Okay, and uh, the ad hoc polymorphism is what we're going to see today. Under this ad hoc polymorphism, we have two types of polymorphisms. One is at compile time, and other one is at runtime. Okay, so compile time polymorphism is grouped again into two. One is a method overloading, operator overloading and the runtime has a method overriding okay so in general if you say overloading and overriding are the only two things that are classified in general if you normally ask anyone they would say well, how many types of polymorphism you have some may start with saying it has a compile time it has a runtime some very high level guys might say it has an ad hoc polymorphism and parameterized polymorphism because parameterized polymorphism is again an advanced topic so people normally won't uh, talk at that uh, level uh, so people will normally start with the compile time or runtime and some will directly start with saying uh, it has uh, overloading and overriding so you achieve uh, polymorphism using an overloading and overriding. So we'll see what is an overloading and overriding, and uh, also uh, the compile time. Uh, today I'm, I will not be showing the operator overloading, uh, which you can do only using C sharp. Um, so probably in next session I will uh, show you a demo wherein you can 
overload an operator. So we have seen a couple of operators uh, like a plus, minus, uh, division, mod, so on. So we can overload that operator to behave differently based on your context again. So that we can do uh, in a later session. For today we will see uh, the method overloading and method overriding. So method overloading um, is again same thing which is having methods or functions uh, with the same name with the variable parameters varying in data types and the order of data types. So in this case if we say, uh, so these are the two characteristics that you need to keep in mind. So you can vary, uh, you can have the same name with variable signatures or variable data types that you pass as a parameter. So in this case I have a string. Okay, I'll quickly go back uh, to the demo so that we'll do, we can do more there. Okay, so in this case I have a um, um, string and I'm going to define another one with, the, so at this stage if you see uh, and if I try to compile it, uh, I'm getting an error saying already defines a member called start with the same parameter types. So the error is the crystal clear for us to know why this is failing because um, you already have the same name with the same parameter with the same parameter types that's a key thing to know so I can have the same name but if I just change this to different type then and build it so in this case um, I have overloaded start with the two different data type parameter types so in this case I have a parameter of type string and in this case I have a parameter of type int. So this, uh, if you notice the name really doesn't matter. You can have the same name uh, in the parameter name I'm talking about. So the parameter name can be same but it should vary with the data type. And also if you look at the other one. So it has a three parameters to it and okay so I will uh, replicate the same again same three parameters again here okay so here I'm doing something else and uh, here I'm doing something else okay it really doesn't matter right now so I will um, take away the body so that to keep our understanding uh, easily um, see if I, I wrote this code another key thing if you just wanted to uh, show you the difference between the how the uh, the compiler the background compiler works in C sharp versus VB.NET right now I don't have the VB.NET code for this uh, but if you typically uh, open this uh, do the same code in VB.NET it will straight away tell you the error uh, I don't have to explicitly compile this so this background compiler that works in VB.NET uh, compiler which is not there in c .net. So for c .net, if I want to see errors I have to compile it. Okay, so when I once I compile this I, I can able to see the error saying the same error which is the same type of parameters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep the same number of uh, parameters but just um, move the first one to the last. Okay, so in this case I have um, double double string and in this case I have string double double. So I still have the same parameters passed but in the order of the parameters are changed. Okay, and now I compile, now it's good. So that's the key difference we need to see. And also another key difference here is um, you cannot actually overload any member with a variable return type. For example, uh, I have this and I will change, make this uh, return type as int. So void returns nothing. So um, I'm just having a, a same name with the same set of parameters with a different return type. Uh, and, oops, sorry. So the compiler doesn't accept. So you cannot overload using a variable written type with the same set of parameters. 
okay so people uh, will ask uh, some of the people not everyone um, especially when uh, uh, especially, especially for the freshers who are looking for a fresher positions uh, people will try to play with them uh, asking such uh, typical questions and uh, most of the time it's very annoying for people uh, because you cannot remember all this uh, thing of variable combinations so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to give you a pretty um, real-time example uh, in other words think about yourself in this case uh, we see uh, start think about yourself if you have ambiguity so, okay if you have if you see two objects uh, with the same uh, of the same type like if you have uh, um, two balls uh, sitting in your living room um, one is uh, 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 yellow another one is also yellow okay and someone asks you to uh, bring uh, get me the yellow ball okay you you go to the living room and see two yellow balls and immediately you'll say which yellow ball okay so both are same right both are same wall same size and uh, same dimensions and uh, both are of same color and you will uh, probably because you're a human you can always say okay yellow ball so whichever yellow ball I pick that's fine right doesn't matter but if your program you you're, you're not uh, that smart right so you always uh, run on certain para certain um, parameters right you will try to locate uh, uh, same method with the same set of parameters and you see two so when you see two which one you to invoke you don't know you cannot decide okay so that's the same ambiguity the compiler will go in so that's why you cannot have um, a same method uh, with the same set of parameters but you can have a different set of parameters in a different order and so on so different data types so on so that way you can make it unique you can identify okay this is a method and this is a block you're trying to call and I can go and pick that call so if you think that way then it makes your life easy so written type doesn't matter because the written type uh, really doesn't play uh, in making your method unique because the number of parameters are passed to you when you make a call so if you, if you remember that when I say start I pass one string or one string or two doubles so that's what matters so whatever you taking as an instruction uh, uh, as part of your message so when I say message passing that's what it means so I'm calling this start passing these arguments so that's a message to the respective object to invoke okay hope that is clear uh, yeah so you cannot have uh, you cannot overload uh, methods with uh, um, with the same uh, name and same parameters parameter types with a different written type okay and another key thing here so there's a new keyword that is getting introduced now what that's a called a virtual okay we'll see uh, what is this virtual keyword okay so now um, so another key thing in overloading here is uh, the last one the overloading can happen within the same class or from derived class so we did not talk about what is a derived class okay so we'll see uh, what quickly what is a derived class. So I'm going back to the, the diagram. This is this is the uh, the architectural edition of the Visual Studio. I'm not sure if you have Express Edition, you might not have this. So uh, you can actually have the uh, diagram view of your code. Um, so in this case, um, so if I expand, I can see what all its properties and methods are diagrammatically and uh, also collapse it. Uh, and this is a very good feature um, uh, in Visual Studio. Earlier it was not there. Uh, there were a couple of other tools that were used for your, um, uh, your this is in other words called a case tools which are computer aided uh, software engineering tools. Um, so. Uh, this is the class diagram that we are we are seeing, and uh, and the code that we are trying to uh, have here is the same code that you hear all I need to do is just drag and drop it to this, and to add a diagram or if you have uh, the the architectural edition which comes as part of the Visual Studio Professional or Enterprise, 
Uh, all you need to do is uh, go to the add and pick the diagram. It will have something called a Where is class diagram? I missed it somewhere. Yep, here it is. So this is a class diagram. All you need to do is just add it and uh, simply <clears throat> drag and drop your code file and it will give you the diagram. So it's very simple. Um, so we'll go back here. Okay, so we were talking about um, the overloading and overloading and uh, we're we're trying to demo, uh, show you the inheritance. Okay, so inheritance, um, in this case if you see, the generalization arrow that we, has, we showed, uh, in terms of UML, it's called as a generalization, uh, wherein uh, your, uh, chi uh, your base class, this is the base class. So the automobile becomes your base class, or it ca it's called as a super class. So wherein other members inherit from it. So when they do inheritance, what they do is, if you see the list of properties and methods that are available in the base class, uh, all those uh, characteristics can be uh, inherited. In other words, they can access all of its uh, public uh, uh, members within the derived class. So whenever you derive uh, uh, to a super class, the class uh, will become a derived class. So this class is, if you see the arrow, uh, car class, in, you can read this as it inherits automobile. So this is inheriting automobile. So when this inheritance comes, so the automobile becomes the base class, in other words, super class, and the class that is deriving will become a derived class. Okay, so this is the uh, basic concept of inheritance. It's pretty simple. If you uh, compare a real-time world again, um, so again, so it is a basic inheritance. You you inherit uh, the characteristics or look and feel of your parents. In other words, biological inheritance. So this is a very common characteristic that you see. You have some qualities or characteristics. Uh, uh, that your parents has uh, in terms of a look, color, feel, emotions, behavior. There are so many things that you inherit without your notice. So that's a, is in other words some even in that context some even refer to as a parent and child. So in this case automobile is a parent class and class is a, a car class is a child class. So based on the context uh, there the way they call this uh, will be different. Okay, so we'll, this is uh, inheritance. At this stage, what I'm going to say is uh, the method overloading uh, can happen uh, within the base class or in the derived class. Okay, so uh, overloading in this case, in this typical example, is there anything that I'm overloading? Yeah, if you see a uh, honk, a honk is there in the base class and the honk is there in the derived class. Okay, so uh, I might have a different, uh, um, if you see, uh, the tooltip is trying to give me uh, its signature also. The honk and it's taking only one um, parameter. And in this case, it's taking the same single parameter. So I have a copy of the same uh, uh, member here, which is an overriding, again, which is the next topic that we're going to talk. And overloading comes into play, if you say the string uh, start, if you see the number of overloaded members I have, I have four uh, uh, overlo overloaded members in the base class and and how many I have here? I have only two, so which are, which are again actually overriding the base class. So overloading can happen uh, in the base class and also in the derived class. So in this case, uh, Okay, I have a different versions of start here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the start and put it in the car. So since car is inheriting from automobile, I'm going to uh, drop it here. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to have a second parameter. Okay. 
Okay, int uh, say something. Okay, so I'm just uh, having a different um, signature set here. I have a single parameter set, I have a double parameter set, and I have a triple parameter set here. And I just added a second one. And this is in the derived class. Okay, and I compile this program and it, it's still good. Okay, so what I did here is nothing but uh, I actually have created another virtual member. Okay, so we were talking about what is a virtual here. So virtual is a keyword that you need to specify to the members uh, in your base class so that the derived class can overload or override them. Okay, so in this case, uh, since I don't have the over overloaded member of start with two parameters, I can able to actually have a virtual member here because this is a brand new member. So in this case, I actually overloaded the start in the derived class. Okay, so overload can happen uh, across the inheritance hierarchy, wherein the derived class and the uh, and base class. So the virtual keyword must be there, otherwise you cannot um, override in the derived class. So uh, in this case, uh, this is the overriding. So wherein, wherein this can happen only in the derived classes. Okay. So you, you have base class automobile, and uh, the automobile should be virtual here. Then only you can actually override from your derived class class a uh, car so the car i have to use an override keyword to override the base class implementation so in this new member it is a virtual for me okay so in this uh, uh, new case here uh, it is uh, virtual because it's brand new here and if i say override here what will happen and compile this, it doesn't say it, um, it's valid. Uh, it's no suitable method found to override. So it is actually override keyword identify, try to look up for the uh, same method on in your base class to override. Okay, so it's not allowed. And another thing, what will happen if I remove the override keyword here? for start and compile again. So it again says, so because, um, okay, let me open up. So cannot override inherited member where it is actually throwing the error in the derived class saying you cannot override because the base class member is not virtual. Okay, uh, because it is not marked virtual abstract or override okay so your base class member is not virtual so you cannot override it so it is key to have a virtual members only virtual members can be overload uh, override in the derived class otherwise they cannot so there you have the control on which member you want to allow which member you want to allow others to override its implementation and write its own. So by the way, what is override again? So that's a key thing here. So override, what I'm doing here is I'm doing some action in the base class as a virtual. So uh, I inherited from the uh, from the uh, from the automobile here and I want to write my own implementation because I, I, I don't want the base class uh, implementation that is provided. So what I'm going to do is I, w I will write my own implementation. Sometimes I want uh, a flavor of both. Okay, so I want to uh, base class to do its own job and also write my own functionality. So, um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I have to go back and fix this and then, oops, sorry, I just have to build this, nothing else. So I just have to compile that and it's good and we'll uh, see the demo how that's going to work. This is the polymorphism code. Okay. 
Okay, so to keep our thing simple, I will not go to our truck and flying car for now. I will just hide them, comment them out, and uh, what I'm trying to do here is now it is a more realistic wherein I have a car, and in this case, I will uh, turn my automobile to abstract, which makes a real sense, right? Because the other block which I uh, commented out uh, was actually using instance of the uh, automobile. That was that's why it was failing. So when I'm getting into the polymorphism, I'm trying to make it more meaningful uh, uh, class relationship here. So in this case, I'm creating instance of a car. So which uh, so nowhere I'm creating instance of automobile as we discussed abstract members cannot be instantiated directly. So abstract, when I make my class abstract, that means I always want them to be base class of some other classes. So this becomes my base class um, and I cannot create instance of it. So that's part of the abstraction that we discussed. Okay, uh, and uh, the car instance here, the car class is actually Okay, let me collapse this. Uh, is inherited from automobile and it ha actually overrides the base class implementations. Okay, and in this case, I'm actually creating instance of the car. Okay, so automobile as a concept, it has some of the uh, attributes uh, given to me and I'm making use of them. So in this case, uh, car, I just have only one prop property, uh, which is category. So otherwise, uh, I can able to, uh, as part of the inheritance, I'm still able to access the make model category. So category is my car specific implementation, whereas make and model are base class implementations. So, so hope that makes it clear. So that's achieved using inheritance since car is getting inherited from automobile. So I'll try, take this out. So if I don't inherit, what will happen? So everything else go for a toss because uh, in the first place uh, all these uh, base dot start I'm trying to call uh, is gone because uh, this start is actually available only in the automobile not in the car and even the start is gone so all these code blocks have failed and uh, most importantly where is my code Oh yeah, so if you see this, uh, even the make and model is errorsome, but not the category, because the category is the implementation of car, not the base class. So if I again inherit uh, car from automobile, then everything is back. So that indicates that all the properties and attributes that are available in automobile are inherited by car so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm actually extending the uh, base class methods or base class uh, functionality. So base class state and behavior, I have uh, the ability to extend them using inheritance. So in, in UML terms, it is referred to as a specialization. So when whenever you do uh, inheritance and implement the base class member, it becomes a specialized class of the base class. So in, in other context, we saw it's a child class. So in other context, we call it as a derived class. So so one. So it has a multiple meanings at the different contexts or different uh, way you use it. So car is a specialized cl class of automobile. Car is a derived class of automobile. Or car is a child of automobile. So all stands same. And in this case, I have um, state definition wherein I have only category. Okay, and the behavior, I'm trying to override the base class implementations because I, I in this case, I want to have the base class member implementation. Uh, this is calling the base class start and also calling the my own member here. Okay, so we'll try to run this code. So if you see, I just added the uh, the right line um, um, uh, in such a way that uh, the output makes sense for me from where I'm calling. 
Okay, so I just had a, a class name here uh, as a constant. If I see, I just added a class name within the car. I am just naming it as a car, and in automobile, I just have the same uh, uh, constant class name as automobile. And what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to write down that name, uh, the class name, in my output. So the output is pretty much uh, writing the class name and the uh, values of that instance down the line. So it's actually trying to write down the make uh, instance name that I'm passing in, which is C1 or C2 or so on. Uh, and the make model current uh, location, which is, uh, we will talk about this type uh, later on. So this is a kind of a, a nested type. We will talk about at the end of the session. Um, and uh, properties and number of wheels, uh, so on. So I'm trying to uh, put down uh, all the values that I'm uh, getting here or in, uh, initialized. So it, it shows me <coughs> that. So when I when it's uh, when I invoke this code, let me go back to the polymorphism demo. Okay, here. Okay, so here uh, this is where I'm setting the values, which I'm defining the state, setting the state of C1. So C1 is reflected here. This is the instance name because that's the name I'm passing in at the methods. Uh, start, honk, and uh, open trunk, right? Um, so when I hit the start, C1.start, so this is C1.start with single parameter, okay? Um, C1.start wherein I pass only C1 there and it invoke the, um, the automobile base class. So the implementation here is actually calling the base dot start. Okay, that's the reason it actually invoked the automobile inst uh, version of the C1 dot start. And uh, after that, um, I'm writing something here, console dot write line, which is from the car instance, uh, car class. And so you invoke the base class implementation as well as the current implementation using the override. Okay, so I can straight away even avoid doing this. So in vb.net, this is called shadowing. Okay, so I will just uh, take this away and compile this and run this. So now I see, I don't see automobile in the first place because I didn't call base class implementation. I straight away call the car implementation. Okay, so this is called uh, in VB.NET shadowing or uh, in, um, in uh, polymorphism terms, it is a overriding. Okay, so this is about uh, overriding and we have already seen overloading and uh, next uh, topic, uh, inheritance. So other way around, we already talked about the inheritance, uh, uh, what is a uh, base class, what is a derived class, super class, and so on. Um, so we, we are, I think we are familiar with that uh, inheritance uh, concept right now. And you achieve that using, uh, uh, in VB.NET, I didn't uh, unfortunately show you the VB.NET uh, code. Um, uh, so you can actually, you can take that as a homework uh, to translate this C sharp into VB.NET. So do you know what is the shortcut to translate uh, um, vb.net to C-sharp code? Uh, you don't really have to write it. If you want to really uh, see that there are very interesting tools online which can, uh, where is this? Okay, if I see, Convert C sharp to VB.NET. Okay, so there there are uh, tools. There are a wide variety of tools actually available, which where you can uh, use to convert the C sharp code to VB.NET. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, yeah, if I say public override and this stuff, I will just put here and say convert to VB.NET. So it's going to give me the vb.net code. So in this case, uh, overrides is the keyword that is needed uh, for override. So th there's just a keyword mismatch. Otherwise, uh, everything is same. Or 
all the uh, examples that we are doing in C sharp is doable in VB.NET also. So there is nothing that um, language specific um, support is completely there from both the languages. Okay, uh, so inheritance, uh, we'll see how many types of inheritance we have. Okay, so the types of inheritance we see uh, here, uh, we have about five types of inheritance that you can do uh, conceptually. Uh, the first one is a single inheritance or a single level, in other words, so single inheritance wherein um, uh, class A and class B you have and B is inheriting A. So it's only one level or a single level, uh, which we have done so far, the so automobile in this case and car in this case, okay? And multi-level is a type of inheritance wherein you can have A, B, C lined up in a uh, multi-level and uh, wherein uh, 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 C inherits B and B inherits C, A. So what will happen in this case is C is pretty much uh, A plus B, okay? So it is a composite class which contains all the members of B and also all the members of A. So that's how um, you can achieve uh, uh, using multi-level inheritance and there is no limit how many levels you can go, okay? And uh, a hybrid is supposed to be the last topic, but uh, since it's here, we'll see hybrid is a mix of uh, uh, multi-level and single level. Um, so in this case, if we say uh, uh, C inherits A is a single level and also B inherits A is a single level uh, and D inherits B inherits uh, a is a multi-level, so it's a mix of both, uh, so that becomes a hybrid uh, inheritance. So this is doable. Um, how it is doable? Because uh, at a g any given point, you see only one class is inheriting the other class, okay? Uh, even B is inheriting A and C is inheriting A, so which is uh, perfectly doable in c -sharp or vb.net. And uh, the next is a hierarchical. Hierarchical, uh, if you see, even hybrid contains hierarchical, wherein A, uh, B and C are inheriting A. Uh, this even represents the single inheritance also, wherein A is inheriting, oh sorry, B is inheriting A and C is inheriting A. So this is a pretty much hierarchical, which you normally see in a uh, hierarchical representation of a, you know, office structure or organization structure, wherein the uh, the chairman or CEO starts first and those uh, break down into structures, right? So that's a hierarchical uh, inheritance, you can do this. And the last one is the multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance is a, a little uh, complex here. So wherein uh, one class is actually inheriting from two different classes at the same time. So C is trying to inherit from multiple classes. Okay, none of the other inheritance were doing that. So this is a special case which is doable perfectly in uh, small talk um, programming languages and which is not doable in uh, .NET uh, or even Java. So Java also doesn't support multiple inheritance this way wherein one class is uh, derived from uh, two other classes or more than two classes. So which is not possible in uh, .NET. Okay. Um, so if you want to demo, let's see. And in this case, as per my class diagram, I have a um, truck, car, automobile, and a flying car. Okay, what I'll do is I will add another car, and uh, while adding, I will also show you uh, how to use the architectural view of the class diagram to create classes, okay? So instead of going to the code, I'm going to do visually. So I, I'll just wanted to see the toolbox. And if you see, there is a set of tools here. I can straight away drag one class here. And I will name something, uh, what do I do? Uh, okay, I'll say something like special. This is a special class uh, which contains, uh, which want to inherit both from truck and car. Okay, let's try it out this way. And it's actually creating a separate file for each class, okay, so if you see. Although you can have multiple classes within the same file, it is not recommended to have. It's always recommended to have a separate class. Uh, that way you can have a easy readability of your code. And I have created a class and also it has created me the code file, if you see, visually and programmatically. So both are in sync. 
and at the same time now I want to do inherit uh, so I'm going to drag this tool and inherit from truck okay and also drag this and try to inherit car so see this is a little smart so it's not letting me do that even graphically so when I try to add a new inheritance to another car it is not it is actually shifting the inheritance from either this or that so that means graphically it is enforcing the uh, the rule that multiple inheritance is not supported in .NET. So what will happen if I forcefully do it? And compile this. It doesn't go anywhere. So what I can do is, as an alternative, I can actually have an interface. So interface, what is an interface? So interfaces as we have seen, um, uh, as we have seen the abstract class, uh, abstract class and interface have a very thin gap between each. So both cannot be created instance, both are used for abstract layer. And in this case, what I'm going to do is um, I will have an interface called uh, what? For example, if you think of a better example that can map to the real world with respect to the automobile. Um, I'll say body shop okay so all of these uh, need a body shop so I'll just define a body shop as an interface okay so within the body um, so I'm just right clicking and adding a method say um, okay fix uh, fix the body just say fix the body uh, as a method okay and uh, okay let me add one more uh, method saying um, paint okay so body shop this are, these are the kind of things that they normally do and uh, if you remember if you see it's so intuitive that if I pick the methods then it will let me add only method and to add any other I can go ahead and add a property also saying uh, is so this indicates that um, uh, fix the um, um, uh, fix the, fixed it or not so I'm just trying to go and uh, set up the properties uh, if you see it's a read and write pro uh, write accessor and uh, so on so you can just play around and uh, uh, type by default it has taken the int as a data type I'm going to change it as a bool okay and I can put some comments here remarks so on which can reflect um, and so on so it's pretty uh, decent so if you say if you have this tool you don't have to really go and write a code it's going to do for yourself right so that's the uh, advantage with the uh, with this uh, architectural uh, uh, car uh, class diagram view and now I have the interface created so it shows here so what I can do here is um, I cannot uh, uh, inherit uh, multiple classes but I can inherit to my interfaces so it's already added a link there if you say car body shop so it's actually an error uh, actually speaking because I uh, wrote a code saying car it's trying to show something but it's not able to do it because that's an error I'm going to take that away and uh, fix this okay okay truck is less accessible than the okay special class whereas truck is not accessible for it we'll see that so I have this uh, okay it's inheriting this and um, that's how I can have uh, uh, I can actually have multiple uh, inherit uh, uh, a class to multiple interfaces but I can inherit only one class 
so that's the rule and the difference between uh, the abstract and interface uh, probably I will uh, show you in the next session um, to keep it simple for this session uh, the only difference between them is that the abstract class can have a concrete members whereas uh, interface cannot have a concrete members within it so if I look at the definition of uh, the interface uh, where is this body shop so if you see this is a body shop so it can have uh, uh, properties and everything just like uh, any normal class uh, and also remember that uh, you cannot create instance of this because interfaces and abstract classes uh, are used for as an abstract layer so as we discussed abstract layer cannot really exist in the real world so in theoretically so that's where they cannot be instantiated so only you can do is you can inherit and implement their uh, behavior so in this case interfaces can have only the signature here and whoever uh, inherits uh, this they need to implement the body of the signature to uh, gain that um, uh, to make this uh, definition a real meaning otherwise uh, interfaces will never have any concrete implementations they just have a signature body whereas abstract members like the automobile here this is an abstract member but it has a concrete members within it when I say concrete it means they have a body so if the bar if the signal if the if your method has a body then this becomes a concrete method otherwise it becomes an abstract method so an abstract class can have an abstract methods and also concrete methods whereas uh, interfaces can have only uh, abstract members not the concrete members so that's the key difference between an um, um, uh, interface and abstract and this is a very very commonly asked question um, and believe me all, all these uh, keywords topics we have been discussing they are all you know, perfectly 100% interview questions and people will definitely ask you no doubt about it they will definitely ask you uh, so remember that and uh, probably I'll have a question poll uh, on this topic in the next session and uh, we will move on with the so we cover the inheritance part as well so we are good there and yes so this is a kind of an add-on as part of my uh, um, curriculum or the topics for discussion I added this as a uh, bonus or addition um, uh, which is an object based programming um, so we have so far seen an um, object oriented programming and uh, the concept of object based programming is a one step back to the object oriented programming so the differences between uh, object oriented and based uh, is a very thin uh, very narrow again and uh, uh, in the object based uh, programming it's pretty much a language or a theory uh, which uh, which is again based on the concepts uh, concept of the object and the object based programming language encourages a methodology methodological uh, methodology sorry methodology for uh, designing and uh, creating a program as a set of autonomous uh, components so if you see if you uh, look at the modular approach of writing programs uh, this is uh, programming languages in the in the early in, in the early version of Visual Basic and uh, Hex is one of the very old one which I'm not even aware of. Um, uh, I just got that, uh, but I'm very well aware of Visual Basic. Uh, I worked on Visual Basic, the Lexi uh, language, and I pretty well know what is uh, what is it capable of. Um, so that's uh, that could be my reference point uh, with respect to the object-based programming. Um, and uh, the only difference is that if you look at in terms of the object oriented programming language is that this doesn't support a couple of um, uh, features like the inheritance uh, so Visual Basic doesn't have the inheritance uh, capability although it can still have the define the classes create instance of them become objects you can do overloading, overriding, you can do all of this polymorphism, you can do encapsulation, you can do uh, abstraction, you can do, but you cannot uh, uh, do inheritance. So uh, that's when um, it became an object-based programming, but it's not an object-oriented programming. 
So an object-oriented programming should satisfy all of those uh, seven characteristics. Out of them, uh, again, the, one of the highly debatable uh, topic is that the multiple inheritance is one of the debatable topic wherein uh, Java doesn't support, VB.NET doesn't support, uh, C Sharp doesn't support, even any .NET languages doesn't support. But although they doesn't support multiple inheritance, they are they claim that they are object oriented or 100% object oriented programming because they have a workaround of using interfaces and uh, they uh, who the the respective compilers really uh, make their own point why it is uh, not uh, uh, supporting multiple inheritance uh, the wide variety of uh, arguments go fly around uh, saying um, uh, it reduces the complexity of a program uh, in one sense so that you limit your uh, level of uh, uh, inheritance hierarchy. So as the level of inheritance hierarchy grow, uh, the complexity of the code also grows. So to address that, um, uh, they got rid of the multiple inheritance because uh, C++ 100% support multiple inheritance. Okay, so that's the FYI. Uh, add on to it and object based programming is all about um, um, that and it's a more modular approach uh, but it has some features of the object uh, um, oriented programming and the next one is a very new and latest which is uh, aspect oriented programming so things have been evolving over a period of time and uh, key thing to keep in mind when you talk about aspect oriented programming um, is that uh, this is not a replacement to object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming has some uh, uh, flaws in sense uh, it is programmatically not possible to not 100% possible to achieve the um, uh, separation of concern. If you new to that uh, separation of concern is one of the basic design principles which is also the first principle of solid principles so solid principles is a set of five principles which are which falls as a backbone for all the programming design um, probably that's my plan to cover that area in the advanced topics uh, so the first principle is a separation of concern uh, wherein the responsibility of each of the module or class that it is trying to do is isolated from one another so you uh, that uh, the concern is separated from one uh, object to another object so that you achieve the reusability aspect and reduce the redundancy so that's a base principle for programming or designing uh, your uh, program um, so um, separation of concern is one of the major problem when you design uh, or a pro write a program using the object oriented programming. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, in as by default, uh, object oriented programming is completely of classes and objects. There is, there is no such thing that you can uh, something hang in air. Like if you have, if you want to have a helper method, for example, that writes say information to a log file, or a helper method, uh, helper classes or helper methods that can talk to a database and get you some information. You know, it, which is uh, really not a a re real time object that represents in the real world. So these are all called as a cross cutting concerns. So the cross cutting concerns is one of the concern in the uh, while designing the uh, program in a true object oriented principles because as per the principles it all talks about uh, having class uh, represent the real world object. So these things like exception handling or logging or database interactions so these are a couple of uh, concerns that you really need in a program but cannot fall under any of these principles so that those are the cross cutting concerns which are like a big bottleneck when you write a, a dot and program. So what that means is, in uh, although uh, I have my domain object model, which is reflecting to the real time objects uh, with respect to my business context. For example, I'm doing a payroll application, and my context is deals with the employee and their payroll information. 
so all the entities involved in the payroll uh, payroll generation like employee salary uh, and uh, so on so paychecks and so on so there are a lot of uh, nouns involved in the payroll processing so all these objects uh, they reflect the real world uh, scenario but where the logging or exception handling or all other things fall like uh, intermediate to all of these so every one of these need to uh, implement a logging, implement exception handling or implement database access and so on. So they are all uh, a, a crossing around all these uh, domain uh, entities. So that's why they call cross-cutting uh, concerns. So they're actually spanning from one layer to other layer or one object to the other object. So they are uh, intermediate to one another but again separation of concern is again important like there because I cannot write a, a a employee class without using a logging in th in simple terms in in my example also I am trying to use a console dot write line which is actually writing something to the uh, output right so that's again a separation of concept so what this object is supposed to do is not doing it is doing more than that because it needs to do so so aspect oriented programming is go is trying to address that flaw uh, in the object oriented programming so it has a pretty much uh, uh, the terminology goes so one of the terminology we already discussed the cross cutting concerns another one is uh, is defines an advice and advice is um, is the additional code which is like a logging or exception handling so this is the additional code uh, that can be uh, referred to as an advice that's a terminology used in aspect oriented programming and the point cut is uh, another keyword which refers to the location of the line of code or, pro uh, or program execution point where you want to introduce the advice. Okay, so the advice is, for example, a logging or uh, any helper method that you want to add. Okay, the point where you want to add it is the uh, point cut. And the aspect as a um, keyword itself is a union of both um, so it's a combination of a point cut and advice so aspect is the place where you want to uh, introduce an additional line of code uh, at what time and where you want to add so that's the aspect oriented programming concept uh, conceptually um, but who all supports this kind of uh, uh, program uh, this language again uh, this is um, paradigm of programming principles so the the well known as on today is the aspect J which is for Java uh, that's the only language that is a true aspect oriented programming language and the rest of them even including dot net um, they actually doesn't support um, uh, the aspect oriented programming uh, but now, uh, still the way the, the .NET infrastructure is set up, it is not a very uh, uh, difficult to achieve it. Uh, it's uh, again achievable using uh, um, there's something called a Unity framework, um, uh, which is a part of the dependency injection module, uh, wherein you can actually inject a couple of modules at runtime um, that can achieve the cross-cutting concerns so at a runtime. So in other words, uh, it, if you have an assembly 1 and assembly B, so assembly A is your uh, domain object model, okay? And assembly B is your cross-cutting concern. So I'm separating both the concerns. So I will write my exception logic only in the assembly B, and uh, assembly A is again completely going to be my business specific objects, okay? So I'm not uh, mixing, a, a playing a mix and match here. So what the compiler expected to do is, at the end, when they compile both these assemblies, they need to be uh, un uh, uh, combined and delivered a new, uh, deliver a new assembly which will mix and match both, uh, which will specify where to introduce my aspect. Okay, so that's a part of the point cut, point cut and advice. So you'll have you will define the advice in the assembly B, and also you define the a point cut information where this need to be injected in point assembly A and you compile them and the, uh, the re resulted assembly will have the uh, uh, assembly with the uh, both the union uh, uni unioning the in inserting the respective uh, aspect at the point cut in, in the assembly A. 
So that's the uh, level of uh, approach uh, to achieve the cross-cutting concerns so, uh, at the same time satisfying the, uh, the first principle called the separation of concern. I hope you got that information uh, into your memory. So unfortunately, I cannot deliver more than that uh, in this aspect because this is just an overview and FYI. And uh, this is gaining a lot of weight in the market uh, down the line. So this my, but again, remember that this is not actually uh, replacing the object-oriented programming language. Okay, so it is. Uh, it is supporting the object-oriented programming language. So this aspect-oriented program is an is an add-on to the uh, sorry aspect-oriented program is add-on to the OOP. So it's not replacing it. So keep that in mind. And of course, as I mentioned, so in .NET there are workarounds uh, wherein you can use to uh, achieve the aspect-oriented uh, uh, principles, uh, but uh, straight away .NET doesn't support. So the straight away the true uh, aspect-oriented programming is a aspect J, which is available for Java. Okay, so that's all for now and uh, let me see if I have any questions.